Our last show focused on Vietnamese Americans, refugees of a lost war who have become a thriving ethnic group, especially in Orange County's Little Saigon. Our guests talked about an ambitious oral history project at UC Irvine, Viet Stories, and they shared their own stories about coming to and growing up in America. They had a lot to say, so much so that we decided to turn our usual post-show open mic segment into a whole second show. More on the lives and lessons of Vietnamese Americans, right now on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by... Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live, they are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Memorial Care is transforming the way healthcare is delivered keeping our communities and businesses healthy by guiding them on the path to wellness with easily accessible hospitals, physician offices, and outpatient centers. Memorial Care, leading the way. Hi, I'm Rick Reef. Let's continue our discussion with two Vietnamese Americans, Linda Vo and Jack Tuan. Linda spent the early years of her life living in a thatch hut in the Mekong Delta, no plumbing, no electricity. Her family immigrated here in 1979, and today she's a professor of humanities at UC Irvine and collecting oral histories, hundreds of them, from Vietnamese refugees like herself. Jack Tuan was a boat child, rustled out of his home in the dead of night to escape Vietnam and eventually to arrive in America. Today, Jack's a civic leader, community affairs manager for Wells Fargo Bank. We pick up the conversation after I ask them if they empathize with current immigrants. You know, I, I do, closer. I do, and, and it's, uh, it comes down to a policy issue, at least in my mind, um, because if, if you look at immigration issues as an economic issue, you know, we have a case study in Orange County uh, that uh, of four years in the making that talks about how uh, an unwanted community became a economic powerhouse and also political powerhouse and engagement, and how the um, the community has acclimated to 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 become American, uh, and the success stories that come out of that. There's a lot of successful Vietnamese American now, um, and, and so it's really uh, uh, comes down to. The policy you know, that makes sense, and, and right now there's just so much divide yeah. in, the, uh, in, in, in our country that, that uh, we just can't agree to a sensible policy that How deals with uh, What do you say to the person who says, "Yeah, but you guys came legally, if you will. You know, you came in, you were you were registered, you got issued those ID cards that we but were." But that's looking my point. At. That's a policy issue. Our government, uh, you know, the U.S. government decided we will give an opportunity to these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's the same thing with the Cubans and other refugees and the Jewish refugees. Yeah. You know, there are examples. We made a decision to accept those. You know, something I didn't have time to ask you, and if, if you could, if you can think of something, let me know. Uh, an act of kindness and an act of cruelty mm -hmm. that was encountered either by you or by one of the uh, the stories that you've heard. Could, can you give an example of both? Mm -hmm. Do you want to start with what you were referring sure. to? Uh, yeah. Well, in, in terms of generosity, you know, we, we had a, um, a church a small in a small town um, who w were willing to uh, take in this family that they don't know anything about, um, and they were willing to put the support behind it. And so when we came, uh, the congregation uh, got donations and, and uh, this found was us in a, South Carolina. In South Carolina, and found a place for us to uh, live, um, help uh, my parents with uh, finding jobs. Uh, and I, we had uh, volunteer tutors that helped my brother and I, you know, learn the language and, and, and get caught up with uh, with school. And was this a re just a religious motivation that uh, God's people should help these people in need? In, in, in my situation, it was. But I also know uh, uh, some of my family members were sponsored by non-religious people that just felt like it's a humanitarian issue. I mean, uh, I think we all want someone to reach out and help us when we're in uh -huh. need. Mm -hmm. Can you remember anything from your childhood when, like, that was mean what they just did to me? Were you heckled at I, school? Or I was. Like uh, I was. I was called a wetback in high school. Um, you know, at, at the time I was in South Carolina. Like I didn't even know what it was, and, and so you know, it was. 
you know, and then. Um, and, uh, so you find out what a what a. Wet I, bag. I found out very quickly what it was. You it said, wasn't hey, a nice. I'm not a wet bag. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it wasn't a nice thing, right? Yeah. And but it was, you know, just knowing what that is, it's, it's just out of ignorance. And anybody that's yeah. different, you you call them whatever name, mm -hmm. you yeah. call. So that yeah, it, it was very difficult to adjust, especially when we were the only, uh, really immigrant yeah. family that were there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would just expand but you hear these stories over and over again of they will identify and they still keep in touch with many of their sponsors um, um, after 40 years you know the family that sponsored them even yeah. though they moved away from the area and so there's so many of these stories of individuals Americans who gave of their hearts you know gave their homes gave financially helped with networks uh -huh. and everything so there's so many small acts of kindness along the way that helped us be successful where we are today um, and given us opportunity. What were some of the cruel things that, that come up? Uh, are there um, any? There was a lot. There was hate crimes against Vietnamese. Um, their businesses, you know, were vandalized. There were protests against them when they put up signs. And what was the main driving force? Do you think? Um, a lot of misunderstanding about who the, the Vietnamese were. Um, a lot of it was that you know they didn't want um, to deal with. Those they had fought within the war. So for veterans, some of them, they had a mm -hmm. lot of issues they were still dealing with. Um, they fought in Vietnam against the enemy. So I think the issue is that it's a civil war. Mm -hmm. So we were allied with the South Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese yeah. were the enemy. But for many Americans, they couldn't tell the difference between a North Vietnamese or a South Vietnamese yeah. when they saw someone who was Vietnamese. And so that led to a lot of misunderstanding. Um, How and about that in school? How was it in school for? It was difficult, I think more than for boys in many ways, because they faced a lot of bullying um, in the schools. Uh, girls less so, um, but just, you know, um, uh, not fitting in, you know, uh -huh. or teachers not understanding where they're coming from, um, f uh, expecting them um, to speak English right away and not helping them. But, you know, those types of things um, occurred in the schools. But in neighborhoods too. So I know people have talked about their homes being vandalized when they first moved into a neighborhood um, and being told they were unwelcomed in neighborhoods. So even in Southern California and Orange County. Yeah. I, I, in a uh, freshman year in college, um, we were, uh, there was a comedian that was uh, uh, at the university and it was. Which university? Uh, it was at UC Irvine. Um, and uh, he, he was there and uh, UC Irvine has a lot of uh, refugee. Uh, students and uh, you know the the jokes they were making was he w w must have saw who was there and and just decided that was a funny thing to do and um, you know started uh, making fun of the, uh, the the accent and the language and you know it wasn't in a playful or funny way it was very demeaning um, and that was in the uh, you know early 90s still you know huh. um, and it was a uh, it's disheartening to see and uh, yeah, I think we've come a long way, but it's still, there, you still occasionally run yeah. across them. And, 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 mm -hmm. and you remember it. I remember it. <laughs> yeah. It made an impact, yeah. mm -hmm. an impression yeah. on me, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I well, think for Asian Americans even, sometimes or Vietnamese Americans, we're told, you know, when someone's mad at us or, you know, we make the wrong turn on, when we're driving, they'll yell at us, you know, uh, cuss at us, and they'll say, you know, go home, go back to where you came from. Really? So still. we still, even as professionals. Well, that's just road rage. You know, <laughs> no, I didn't mean to make light of it, but, but uh, you know, yeah. well, here's, here's another one. Is this not like maybe it's road rage? But we were uh, playing football on the street, just like any uh, um, American neighborhood, and uh, just happens it was in Garden Grove, and we were having a lot of fun, making a lot of noise. And, uh, we had a uh, someone come out of their house and say, you, sh you know, shut up, go back to Nip Town. Out of the blue, and we're just kids playing mm -hmm. football. Mm -hmm. and that's a derogatory term towards Japanese Americans, yes. particularly. Yeah. So, so you got wet back. You got yeah. You got all the wrong down, terminology. You know, yeah, <laughs> but, 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 but you're taking it. <laughs> okay. Well, anyways, listen. It was great having both of you on. Thanks so much for coming. Is there anything else that you would like to have gotten to, Linda? Oh, because I'm, I know you. You give <laughs> lectures and you can go forever. But is, is there anything else? Any parting thoughts that? Uh, well, you know, I think, you know, the work that Jack has done to support this project, and he supports so many different projects mm -hmm. in the Vietnamese American yeah. community um, as well. It's just that we're trying to leave a history and a legacy, you know, um, for future generations. So all these oral histories that we're collecting, um, 
And how it's many have you collected now? We've collected over 450, and there are 200 online, fully transcribed. Uh -huh. And we probably, I should have said this too, of course, but we get 50,000 hits per month on the website. And so uh -huh. we're finding out that K through 12 students are, are using them and college students are using them. Are there a lot more oral histories to go? I mean, are they... We've uh, only transcribed 200, so we, that's why we, we're trying to raise $2.3 million to create an uh -huh. endowment so that we can process and collect more documents and and artifacts and materials. Yeah. And it really is a great story when you think about it. I mean, the, uh, the Vietnamese community now, as I, as I had mentioned, about almost two million uh, mm -hmm. Vietnamese Americans in the United States, and, and prior to the 70s, just a handful, really, right? Very few. Yeah, the thousands. And, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. exchange students and mm -hmm. officers and being trained, things like that. But, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a lot of people. That's a, that's a big community that Mm -hmm. suddenly happen in less than half a century. Right, so we all, ha we're just clacking a small, small segment of that. Um, and we try to do everyday stories, you know, of or ordinary people who have extraordinary stories you would not believe, you know, and that's what I've learned through this process. Just amazing stories, and they'll say, oh, I didn't do anything important. But we're like, how did you survive the war? How did you get here, you know? And they have these amazing stories. But we're also collecting um, really important people that have done a lot, leaders in the community. So you find people are reticent to talk. You know, we thought when we first started the project that no one would talk to us, especially because we said, you're going to be on the internet and the world can hear your stories. But they're, at a, they're ready to tell. Many of these people are, you know, elderly. They recognize that when they um, pass away, their stories will be forgotten. So this is an opportunity for them to tell their story in their own way, in their own words, and for it to be recorded, and also to supplement it with documents and photographs. And so yeah. we just collected. I. I talked to Tony Lamb since I got to UCI in early 2000. Tony Lamb, Tony explain Lamb, who he is. The first elected official of Vietnamese ancestry in the United States. I met with him multiple times when he was still an elected official in early 2000 because he retired in 2003 from elected office. We just collected his story this year and we spent a whole week with him, many hours collecting his papers and documents. And he's he was finally ready 15 years later. <laughs> yeah. That's so. kind of interesting, bringing up Tony Lamb. I mean, we'll go a while here. Maybe we'll turn this into a part two. I don't know that, <laughs> or this is going to be just a really long uh, open mic segment for us. But um, uh, Tony Lamb, uh, when was it? Maybe 20 years ago or so? Uh, the, 1992, the, when he okay, was first elected? That was a big deal. Mm -hmm. He was a council member in mm -hmm. Garden Grove, Westminster. Was it? Westminster. Or Westminster. Mm -hmm. All right. And that was like a milestone. It was. Now look at all of the officials that have happened since then. You now have had assembly people mm -hmm. and uh, or assembly Senator. members. Mm -hmm. uh, Janet Wynn, who's mm -hmm. in, in the assembly. Before that, she was a supervisor. Uh, you know, so it seemed that you've had mayors, right? Haven't there yes, been Vietnamese yes. mm -hmm. uh, American mayors? Mm -hmm. And uh, so when when do we get the uh, the U.S. senator? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> well, we've had someone in Congress, you know, so that's that's, that's, that's true. true. That's Con impressive. Congress so. people, yeah, and, yeah. And what other areas? Uh, how about in business? Uh, give us, uh, uh, Jack, some folks you know who are, uh, you know, a person that comes to mind. Uh, our friend uh, Tam Wynn. Uh, he and his sister uh, owns the uh, Advanced Beauty College. And, uh, they're second generation business owners and the uh, largest. Uh, but their family you, probably influenced a lot of the, the nail salon and, and the, the nail business in California, probably. Well, mm -hmm. and you know what? Let's talk about that for a moment. Because, uh, you know, and jokes have been made about that. But um, I, I think it's jokes based on, uh, you know, a, a real phenomenon, which is that when it comes to nail salons, mm -hmm. I mean, the Vietnamese, have, the Vietnamese Americans have pretty much cornered that business. Why, why is that? How did that mm -hmm. come about? Yeah, definitely it's an economic niche for them. Um, it was a profession that was easy to get training in, easy to get licensed in, and even you can do it in language, in the Vietnamese language. Um, and you don't have to have a lot of English or a lot of education. So for many refugees, that was a very easy job. And it's mainly female, but now they're have males you heard in the it. the Tippi Hedren story? Yes, and Tippi Hedren, uh, that's the, the story. actress. Yes, she helped to Alfred start. Alfred Hitchcock, <laughs> Birds, and. Uh -huh. Go ahead, tell that yeah. story. I, I love that story because she had something to do with this. Apparently, yes. Um, so she, you know, had her nails done professionally and she was um, a humanitarian who helped with the refugees, with some women refugees um, up in um, California, Northern California. Um, and they saw her nails and admired her nails. And so she brought her manicurist 
uh, and had that manicurist teach the women how to do it, um, nails. And they started setting up their own, uh, or going to business or setting up their own shops. And um, with Tam's parents, they were the ones who started Advanced Beauty College. Um, his mother knew one of the students, um, or one of the refugee women um, in that. So it's a very small community. And it's just amazing how mm -hmm. it... Uh, yeah. You know, that, that, um, a source of livelihood. I mean, it even is. even in South Carolina, there was a family that came uh, later uh, than us. Maybe, and uh, I just uh, went back uh, last year to to visit and uh, heard this family uh, had now owns a nail salon. But because of that, they were able to put all their kids to med school, and they're you know living the American dream right now. And I think mm -hmm. that's a common story across uh, a lot of that. You know. Not only that industry, and I think it's competitive, but a lot of kids have been put uh, through college to get their education and, and have achieved a, a sort of a professional status um, because of the parents' sacrifice and doing some of these really difficult jobs. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that's what um, a lot of my students, that's huh. how they are being paid their tuition through their parents. What would you say the biggest challenges are that face the Vietnamese American community? Um, I think one of the issues we talked about was healing. You know, they're still healing for the first generation um, because of what they went through, the Civil War, displacement, and then there's some intergenerational friction oftentimes um, because the children oftentimes speak English really well, limited or no Vietnamese, um, and then it's just the communications between generations in some ways I think continues. There's also um, uh, families who still struggle uh, economically in terms of living in poverty or also educational challenges. Yeah, how, so. how is, you know, everybody perceives, uh, they always hear Asian Americans are so successful. Mm -hmm. And Asian Americans are not a single group. I mean, as mm -hmm. I noted, we've got, you know, there's all different. Uh, so how do you, uh, you know, how are the Vietnamese Americans doing, you know, in, in, in your opinion? Yeah. I think it has to do with what you asked about the waves. You know, the wave that came in 75 were probably had the most contact with Americans, had higher levels of English proficiency and higher educational levels. The later waves that came in the 70s, 80s, and 90s were very mixed, and many of them did not have you know, English language skills or um, occupational skills that were mm -hmm. transferable here. So they faced a much more challenging time we set on. And there was much less welcome <laughs> reception, there was much less financial assistance. Um, mm -hmm. They received much less than the 75 wave. Uh, in terms of government assistance for refugees as well. So they continue to face, you know, high school dropout rates, educational yeah. issues, um, unemployment or underemployment. So our community is very yeah. mixed um, in there. Yeah, it's Jack, do you, I suppose you have to draw distinctions. As a group, though, Vietnamese Americans are doing quite well, aren't they? I thought I saw something that suggested, and they, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that the average income of a Vietnamese American is above the national average, uh, or do you? I, I haven't seen that, but I, I think uh, at least uh, in the nonprofits that I work with, you know, uh, to what Linda had already said, that there's still a um, uh, uh, segments, and some are doing really well, They're very successful in business, very successful as uh, physicians and lawyers and, and, and all those uh, um, prestigious uh, professions, but. Um, there, there's still a segment, you know, literacy is still a problem. Um, uh, you know, we still uh, see uh, in my work and in, in my community development work for as far, we still see that uh, family are doubling, tripling up in homes just to make ends meet. Sure. Um, you know, the, the nail salon industry, I mean, that's not a, unless you own the salon, it's not a very high paying job, right? And, and people are, are yeah. working really, uh, I think, but the, the, the um, the advantage maybe is that uh, a lot of, of Asian Americans in general, but I think as a refugee community, the Vietnamese American highly value uh, education. And so they'll do whatever it takes to put their kids to, to school as best yeah. they can. But you know, along with that, if you're working two jobs, who's watching your kids? And, and you know, it, it, it's sort of a catch-22. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Maybe I could talk to what Jack just mentioned sure. in your question. Um, household income is what you're looking at yeah. when we captured census data. Uh -huh. And so what he's saying is there are multiple um, 
adults who are wage earning um, in family, who are earning wages in the family. And so you have more than the average American okay. family. So if you have three people who are adults earning wages, so maybe, maybe, that what, is maybe I'm looking income. at household, if you look yeah. at per capita, it would be a different uh, story, yeah. not as high. Yeah, and so I think uh, that's what people use that oftentimes yeah. to say that, you know, Vietnamese Americans are doing so well. They are, but if you look at it, you know, they're making sacrifices. Yeah, okay. Let, let, me, let me ask you another question on politics. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, unlike, unlike most newly arrived immigrant groups, maybe the Cubans are also an example of this, uh, very conservative, at least, you know, that first generation. Uh, and in Orange County, welcome, welcome to Orange County in that regard, be, you know, you're going to vote Republican. Uh, uh, and there's been that perception, you know, because uh, the Republicans were perceived as more anti-communist or whatever, that's mm -hmm. been the tradition. Is that changing? Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right about the conservatism within the community, and it had to do with the Republican Party was more staunchly, staunchly anti-communist. Uh -huh. But if you look at the younger generation, you can see they're leaning towards more the Democratic in terms of how they voted um, at the national level for presidents. Um, they actually vote more Democratic. The younger generation, Vietnamese American, and the that's older generation—that's what young people do. Or <laughs> that's partly it, but they don't have that same sentiment. Yeah. You know, they weren't—they were much younger when the war yeah. ended, or they were raised. But remember, it's 40 years, so we have a whole generation of second generation right. who were born after the war. So they don't have that same affinity, that same history yeah. uh, with so, communism. So, so far, interesting. The prominent—I think uh, all of the prominent Vietnamese politicians in Orange County have been Republican, right? Except for a couple. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and and so, but you're saying that might be changing with a, with a new generation. Um, you see that already changing um, in terms of the elections, but you'll see, I believe, more yeah. Democrats running for um, office from the Vietnamese yeah. American community. Linda, you mentioned the generational conflict. So, Jack, let me ask you for your interpretation of that. What does that really mean? Kids are telling their parents or grandparents, "You don't know anything. Don't tell me what to do." <laughs> I mean. I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I actually want to go back and yeah, kind of sure. give, give my um, uh, theory on some of that as well uh, in terms of uh, the movement to the, uh, being a Democrat. Is I think uh, this, this younger generation saw how you know, government can help. Uh, you know, y y the idea of pulling yourself up by your bootstrap is sort of the American way, but the, uh, a lot of them uh, came with some assistance from Go, uh, the government, and so they see that hey, we, we do need a little bit of assistance at least get to a point where we can pull ourselves up our bootstrap. And so, uh -huh. I, I think that could be one of the reasons why it's trending towards um, younger generation being Democrats. Um, but um, w as far as uh, uh, you know, the the conflict between generation, I mean, I think no matter what ethnicity you are, you, you're going to have those conflicts. I think it's just a little bit magnified um, because. Um, when you have uh, an older generation that doesn't speak and do, can't express himself um, uh, in, in ways that the, the kids will understand emotionally um, or refuse to, um, it, it creates problems. And so even for myself, sometimes communicating with my parents is a little bit difficult when we're talking about you know, feelings and emotions. And sometimes I even translate things literally from English. Uh, it, and it doesn't translate in a very respectful way of talking. <laughs> right? And then you, you throw in the culture, the culture where um, uh, the parents have a lot of say in the household. And so, you know, especially the, 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 the father uh, in the household has uh, a lot of influence. And so kids, you know, today, you know, when even for me growing up here as a, as at a young age, uh, we're instilled with that sense of, uh, you know, you need to be independent. You need to, you know, and that's a, that's a cultural conflict. And so that adds to sort of the general sh generational conflict as well. Well, I think it was heart it'll be heartening for some parents to know out there that even the community affairs manager of Wells Fargo <laughs> Bank has communications issues with That's his right. kids <laughs> at times. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, finally, we, um, uh, talk a little bit. Uh, you're you're a martial arts guy too, right? And now uh, talk about that in your training. You're going to be an Iron Man. What's, what's all <laughs> you're, you're, uh, you're outing me. I have to do this publicly now. <laughs> no, uh, you have to do it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a it's a bucket list thing I want to do before I turn fifty. So I'm in the middle of training. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to complete an Ironman in, in November. Um, so that'll be uh, just a fun thing. And yeah, the martial arts thing was something that uh, was my way of connecting back to to my um, uh, heritage, and uh, I've used it as a platform to uh, 
develop uh, leadership skills in kids. And yeah, so, so you work with kids uh, too, yeah. among the many other things you do, and you're both doing great work. Uh, and again, Linda and Jack, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on. And I think we've managed to uh, actually turn one show into two <laughs> shows. How, how about that? So anyway, uh, uh, finally, again, uh, people, if they want to uh, find out about the project, the uh, uh, Viet Stories project at UCI, just Google Viet Stories, and mm -hmm. they will. Uh, They'll, they'll see all the work you've been doing at UCI. More than 150 oral histories are online, and UCI has many other histories and artifacts for viewing. Again, just search for Viet Stories and you'll find the site. Thanks again to my guests, Linda Vo and Jack Twan. You can watch this show in past shows by going to pbssocal.org or rickreef.com. You can also catch our shows and our post-show open mic chatter on YouTube. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Inside OC. Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live, they are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Chapman University is a proud sponsor of Inside OC and community programming.